Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Shotgun Start. I don't know what I'm doing here with this intro. It is Wednesday, Ju- July 24th. I had to look up the date. Shane, how are we doing? Well, I got a bone to pick with you, Andy Johnson. Oh, God. Right, right out of the, right right out out of the, the gate. gate, a little a, a little pop. Listen, th- there's this... Apple, a few years ago, introduced something to our lives that I think is awful, and I'm not a big fan of it, and it's the tap back reaction to a text message. That's the thumbs up, thumbs down, ha ha, whatever the hell that the, the, the list goes on and on. You've become a tap back only responder on text message. And it's kind of getting into my, uh, it's kind of getting into my grill here. I'm not a big fan of it. I need, even if it's a ha ha or an LOL or something where you texted it out, but the tap back response to me, it's, it's a brush off, bro. It's not a brush off. It's not a brush off. It's listen. I, I find it to be the most economical text back. I, I want to ban text messages. I want to get rid of text messages. I think they're they're damaging society. Uh, oh, so I, uh, so back to, to only phone calling. Is that the yeah, deal? Yeah, I'd much prefer a phone call. Uh, have you got into? Do you get into the audio messaging yet? Have you gotten into that world? Because my wife does it, and God, it drives me nuts when she. I like. We'll just be somewhere, and she starts talking into her phone. I'm not a big fan of it. Are you into that world? I. I mean, I've. I've encountered it i would say that i would say that one of the things that i'm i'm worst at is any form of communication yeah okay well. outside of phone calls the best way the best way to get a hold of me is to pick up the phone and call i might not pick up you know but in general i would say that i'm just a poor communicator it's not not my strong suit it's not my bread and butter the text messages I mean, like people text you about everything. It's crazy. I, I just, I can't, I can't do the text message. I, there's just, I don't like being available all the time. Do you, you, but you don't do the do not disturb thing much. You should start leaning into that a little bit more. The swipe down, throw the do not disturb on. Then when somebody sends you a text, they know but then you're busy. I miss phone calls. Then I miss, <laughs> I miss stuff. You I miss don't get the, alerts. The level of communication you actually like. <laughs> you get, you get, you can turn on the ringer for phone calls that's my phone is always on do not disturb but it only it vibrates for phone calls you you got to figure that out that's this is uh, i might have to next time i'm with you pj i'll have you get the phone dialed andy andy i've been lucky enough to be a, a whatever you call me a guest or whatever you want to call this on the shotgun start probably 20 to 30 times. I think I listened to the first episode of this podcast however many years ago i've never been more excited to be on this podcast, knowing that for the first time I was going to get a little PJ in my life. I love the addition of PJ on the pod. It's been great. Yeah, this is a, he's uh, he's come in. He's fit in seamlessly. He's like, he's what you want. He's a, I, I'm trying to think of the sports comp where he's come in, just slid into a mediocre team and made him slightly more mediocre. Well, you know, you know what? You know what he is? He's he's golf's version of the new caddy. You know, when you I know you love that a lot where a player get somebody new on the bag and you know what? It's going to change their game guys. This is going to be it. This is what's going to lead them to majors. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like when the bulls sign a mid-level exception player, you it's, know, they, it's not like the bulls. I it was like la- last year they signed Tory Tory Craig. Uh, and you know, <laughs> it just, uh, it I, took thought, a- <laughs> I thought I was at least getting Caruso, but no, I'm getting Tory Craig. Okay. I mean, Car- Caruso was, it was a, was a, yeah. Great I mean, that's player. like a fringe, that's like a fringe all-star PJ. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> if there's anybody out there, by the way, listen to this <laughs> podcast that's involved in the Chicago bulls organization. If you can get PJ a Craig Jersey, I will pay for the shipping. I'll, I'll say that right now. We get him a Tory Craig Jersey, Tory Craig Jersey. If you get that his way, I will pay for shipping. I might even pay for the jersey. Uh, Andy, how many minutes PJ, into this do we talk golf? PJ, you are you a Knicks or a Nets fan? I'm I'm a Knicks fan. Nobody's a Nets fan. <laughs> That's factual. That's they, factual. They're not they're not real. No, no, no. You could be like uh like Quentin Grimes a few years ago. That's I liked <laughs> Quentin Grimes. I didn't want to trade Quentin Grimes. I'll take that. I'll accept that. <laughs> that I'll take. <laughs> Hey, didn't Andy, like, the, didn't Andy, like the Craig, Tory Andy, Craig. Andy, before we get into the actual golf talk, I had one last conversation on communication. Who do you think is number one on minutes talked to a week on your phone? Who do you think you talk to the most on your phone? Oh, that's a good question. Probably Pete, who we work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe Brendan. Um, 
Definitely not my wife. No. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, call, nobody calls their significant other on the phone. It's like, I'll see you and we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about you? I mean, uh, probably my buddy Greenberg, uh, who's my degenerate gambling friend that lives in Vegas. He's probably who I talk to the most. Um, or my dad, I would say, are probably one, two on that list. Yeah, it's um, it depends also like on the week, right? If I'm away, my wife could sneak in there, you yeah. know. If I'm if I'm gone, but if uh, if I'm around, it's I don't know. I I have no clue. Um, all right, we're we're off. We're <laughs> off and running here. Six this- minutes in, baby. I knew we could do it. <laughs> um. We've got a, we've got, I don't know how to describe this week. It's like a hangover week here on the PGA tour and and golf in general. We still have, we've got like a little bit of like your, your next morning, Bloody Mary uh, coffee golf with the senior open. We got the 3M, which I I don't know really what to say about the 3M. It's, it's there, but most importantly, we got to do a little CUDA wrap up. We, we recorded before the CUDA was over (laughs) last week. Um, one of our favorite tournaments here at the Shotgun Start. Uh, just kind of a, a delightful watch. Nick Dunlap becomes the first player to win as an am and a prof- an amateur and a professional in the same year. How about that? I mean, it's, it, it's just one of those stats that you know somebody thought of, and then they just looked over, like, all right, uh, what did Verplank do that year? What did Phil do that year? And they went. This is a stat. This is a stat we need to tell people in. But have you looked at his season? It is absolutely banana land. 17 events, two top tens, two top tens for our boy. And they're both victories. Crazy. I feel like um, this is the season that you'd expect from like a 20 year old. Right. Well, a 20 year old superstar like any. I don't want to say any amateur could win. But a lot of really, really high-level amateurs could win on the PGA Tour. I believe that. I think there's probably five, six, seven right now. If I started to name some of the amateurs out there that I think are talented enough to win, you've got to be very, very elite to contend and potentially compete in two of these events. And I mean, I know Dunlap's a pro, Andy, but I kind of still think of him as an am, you know, just because obviously he started the season as an amateur. So I think this is... Pretty damn impressive. I mean, outside of Scotty's season and Xander's season, this is going to be high on my list as an accomplishment that we'll talk about in a few years. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I, I'm not sure. I think like Dunlap obviously has like a lot of, uh, you know, things that he's going to get better at and a lot of seasoning. But like winning is an absolute skill and winning twice on the PGA Tour at age 20 or 19, whatever he is, uh, is extraordinarily impressive. Um I got a bone to pick with the PGA Tour here. Uh oh. I mean, what are we doing? He's this guy's won twice on the year, and he's sixty fourth in the points. He might miss. He might miss the playoffs. Hey, wait, is is that because he didn't get the points from the Am win? What's, yeah, is that the th- reason? Yeah, from the Amex, he doesn't get the points. That is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> so that makes no sense. Here's this guy. I mean, like. Finished tenth at the Rock Mortgage, twelfth at Memorial, and he's got two wins. And he's and he finished eleventh in Houston. So he's had like, you know, he's got what is that? Three top twelves plus two wins. And he might not make your playoffs. Like to me, that screams there's something wrong here. Like this guy. By, by the way, I just want to <laughs> let you know this. Diving into more PJ Tour stuff. Their website says he has two top tens. And you just mentioned the T10 at the Rocket Mortgage. So that means that they don't count his win as an amateur as a top 10. So again, what are we doing? What? It's cra- crazy. So anyways, I guess this this ushers in where we are. Maybe the most, I think, listen, majors are great. But us as golf fans, we're locked in now. You know why? Why is that? We've started the march to the ultimate prize. This is the most exciting time in pro golf. We are we are marching towards the FedEx Cup playoffs. The top 70. I think like honestly, if I'm going to give the the tour some flowers, the change to the top 70 makes all the world of difference with this with this playoffs. Like there are like guys that have played like pretty good this year that might not make the playoffs. Uh, I mean, 
Nick Dunlap might not make the playoffs despite winning twice. <laughs> uh, I, I just recorded a podcast with Andrew Putnam on the Get a Grip feed. If you haven't listened to that, make sure you download it and get a listen. I love the episode Delightful. we just talked about. Delightful. But, I mean, I mean, he's he's seventy fourth on the FedEx Cup points list with two events to go, and we talked about approach and mentality. The weird part this week, Andy, or this year, Andy is you get that week off break because of the Olympics. I think hockey ran into this a few years ago with the Olympics where they had to take a break in the regular season because of the Olympics as well. But you play this week, and then you get a week off, and then the Wyndham's the week after the Olympics. So you've kind of got two events to approach as your final event because you obviously know they're not coming back to back. And Andrew talked a little bit about the mentality going into these two tournaments, but I'm with you. I mean, I think making anything tighter and less spots available makes it more fun to watch. And what's funny about golf is we talk a lot about other sports, especially you and I love to comp other sports to golf. Golf's the only one that's going the other way in terms of the playoff numbers. Everybody else is adding more teams to playoffs. They're, they're, they're allowing more entryways into their final events of the year and golf is shortening it as it needed to. And I think top 70 makes these two events a lot more appealing than they used to be. Yeah. I think, I think that you could even go further. Um, you could get a little bit more razor edge just in terms of like, I think obviously I think it seems like the tour is going to condense a little bit. It's membership. Um, you know, I think that what, what they have like probably about 240 exempt players right now, 250 or so 225 exempt players, some form of exemption. If you get it down to 150, could you get the playoffs to 50 players? And then, you know, what you can you do? I think one of the things is when you have less players, it opens up format options and venue options. Um, and I, obviously, I think like if you were going to critique the playoffs, uh, I think one of the big critiques, especially after we watched Royal Troon, um, the condition, the weather conditions really challenging the best players in the world and creating like this test that like it was like, wow, you have to really hit golf shots. We're going to Memphis and Atlanta <laughs> and Colorado for, for, and I, nothing against Colorado. That's it's nice that Colorado gets a golf tournament for a change. Um, but you're going to Atlanta and Memphis as mainstays in your playoffs in August. It is like pretty much the opposite form of golf than what we watched this weekend that I think had everybody falling in love with, with the sport. So I think the, um, when you think about the smaller fields really opens up venue optionality because it becomes a smaller and smaller footprint for, for the, you know, you need like, it's little things like the range is going to be less chewed up. Right. Um, but also, then the more elite the field gets, I think it interests more and more golf courses. I think there is a big value of like, yeah, it's going to be the top 50 players or the top 70 is a huge like selling point to these clubs and courses that you might want to host. This is like an intimate event with the very best players in the world. Let me ask you a question about infrastructure, because we talk a lot about this. And anytime you bring up any golf tournament or playoffs, why do we go to 18? It's always, you know, the fans are here, yada, 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 right? Are we, why are we married to the grandstands? Why are grandstands so necessary to these golf tournaments? So I was a member at Phoenix Country Club before I moved to the Northeast, and we always had the Charles Schwab Cup, and you put these grandstands up around the golf course. This is obviously peak golf season in Arizona, it's November, December, January, February, right? They put these grandstands up. It would take, it would take months for the grass to get back to, to normal again. You know, as, you're, as a member, it's a bummer when obviously areas are chewed up around the golf course. Why are we married to this grandstand idea if, if that's the issue? If the golf courses that we want to play don't want their courses to be shut down for six months post-event, could we just not have grandstands? Is that an option? I think it just limits like how good the viewing experience is, right? I mean, I know that, but my point is, is that where the tournaments make money? Are they making money from ticket sales and people coming in and having to have 50 to 100,000 people out there every day? Or if you shrunk the amount of people available there and tried to find other avenues of, of you know, income from an event, could you take that away? And then golf courses that are historic or high level or have big memberships might say yes to something when you don't have... 15 plots of grass around your golf course, they're going to be dead for two months after they leave. Yeah. I do think smaller, 
smaller scale, the hard pro- part is I think that most of the on course revenue goes to the charity. So okay. yeah. Shane hates charity. No, don't add me to poor Athrin. It's not on this week. I'm not just taking a seat on the podcast here. I love charity. One of my favorite things. Don't come at me now. I have to ask, um, you're at, at Phoenix Country Club. Did you ever sit in the bar stool that famously Jeff or uh, that uh, was it? Uh, What's his McCarran. name? Uh, was it McCarran? McCarran? Yeah, Scott McCarran sat in as Jeff Maggart, you know, came down the stretch in that famous uh, Schwab Cup finale. I think I think it's dedicated now. I don't think you can sit in it. I think they've dedicated <laughs> it. They might have made it gold or whatever, whatever, whatever they bronzed it or something like that. But uh, I don't know if I've ever sat in it. I think that's a real special spot up there in that, that the top bar. We're talking about how short PGA Tour careers have gotten over the years, you know, as as for the youth wave. I feel like the champions, the champions tour, the the flame burns bright and short because McCarran was like a three year thing, and now and then he just lost it. He just lost it. Oh, uh, Andy, I remember, you know, because McCarran was on the Fox broadcast team before he turned fifty. He was on there Banker for a short boy. stint, I think, for maybe a year or so. And I remember we played Detroit Golf Club. The whole group of us played. I think there was like eight of us out there, like Faxon and our producer and Joe Buck played and stuff. And I was playing with McCarran and he was 49 at the time and it was six or seven holes in. I mean, he was absolutely sending it off the tee, hitting like 305, 310 and everything was close. and He was putting great. And I was sitting there going, this dude's going to be a problem on the champs tour. But yeah, I mean, he was. He, was he the best player on the Champs Tour for a couple of years? And now yeah. he's he's totally irrelevant? Is that, is that fair I think to say? That, I think so. Something happened. He just like he stopped an injury, being... injury, I think. Yeah, he just like stopped being able to play. Yeah, you know? it's crazy. It's uh, Ernie. Ernie's out of the Open, the Senior Open. He's is not he? playing. Must be serious injury. Speaking of, I saw John Daly uh, WD to the Open, and I think on Sunday or Monday, I saw something posted that he played Turnberry. So obviously, whatever whatever he had to pull out of at the Open, uh, he got healed up before well, uh, before he that round. Probably, probably could take a cart out there. That's a good know? point. That's probably good. let him take a cart. Oh, so. Andy, I had a question I want to throw at you. I had a question uh, on, on, on my list of things to ask you. So I was thinking about Tiger and reps, okay? And I think you and I, people that played golf or play a lot of golf, understand that you're never going to become... I think the biggest issue right now to Tiger's golf game is his putting. It's awful. His putting has been atrocious in these major championships. He misses every eight-footer that he used to make, and it just never keeps the round going, right, when you can't make those putts. Tiger's never going to take a golf cart in these major championships, I don't think. Do you think Tiger would potentially take a golf cart in non-major events just to get the reps? Do you think that would be an option he might lean into? I don't think so. I don't okay. think I don't, okay. like I think that's the issue, right? I do I just, think that would help a lot. Yeah. Just getting you, the reps, man. You know, just like he always talks about it, but it's so true. You can't get comfortable on those putts if you're hitting them at Augusta and then you're hitting them at Valhalla and then you're hitting them at Pinehurst and you're hitting them at Troon. It's just going to be hard to get comfortable. I was just wondering if if in terms of the prep, if he was really serious about playing well in these majors, if he'd at least consider the card at I mean, not even the non make do it to the non signature events, right? You know, play in the play in the other events with a cart. It's I just like how many events do you think he needs to play to have a chance to be sharp enough? I think he's got to play two before the Masters. I think he'd need to play two events before the Masters. I'm not sure which two I'd pick out, and I think he's got to play at least one in between the majors just to kind of keep it going, keep it rolling. So it's like eight events a year, nine events a year. Yep. I think eight, I think eight is, I think think eight's realistic. I don't think, see, like my issue when I think about it is like, I think he needs to be around 12 a year. That's a lot, man. I I mean, you're probably right, but it's a lot. Because if you think about when he won, you know, he had the, he, he was playing about that cadence rolling into the tour championship. Then he had the Zozo in the fall. Yeah. Then he's playing the hero. He's playing the PNC. It was like a rolling calendar, right? It wasn't like just like, oh, I'm here. You know, <laughs> that's the hard thing. I don't think two events before the Masters would make enough of a difference. Like maybe he'd be ready to go by the Open, which might be like his best chance now, even though the weather doesn't seem like it's his best chance. Um, I don't know. I think we're we're at a a different stage and and. Just uh, understandably so with Tiger, yeah. right? Like, I mean, like the guy almost lost his leg. It's like a miracle that he did and you didn't 
you know, lose his leg. And I think that, you know, the back injuries and the leg injuries before this one are were one thing, but this one is like a catastrophic. I mean, like Alex Smith, sure, he came back from like something similar. He was never the same. Right. You right. know, he was it was a miracle that he got on the field. And I think that's kind of where we're at with Tiger is that it's a miracle that he can even play. Right. And he can hit the shots. See, that's my thing, Andy, is I watch him on the golf course. You know, we cover him closely at the at the Masters every year on the feature group ch- channel. And I watch him doing what he does. And a lot of the golf shots are good. Like, there's some squirrely ones in there. I mean, there's some ones that aren't very good. I remember last year he chunked the seven iron on seven. I mean, he literally hit it like 110 yards. And that's going to happen time to time. But I just feel like the putting is the thing that keeps him from posting the 72. And now it's 75 and it could be 70 occasionally and it's just not. And I'm just wondering if there's any level of play that could get that feel to a point where he could start to make those eight footers that he used to make routinely to keep the rounds going and to post something that's respectable. Because to me, these are the rounds that are going to push him out of golf, right? Rounds like Mm -hmm. he played at Troon's like, He's or that he not, played at Pinehurst. Or right? he played at Pinehurst. I mean, it's going to be the, the score so high that I'm sure Tiger feels in some level embarrassed about the game. I mean, he shouldn't be embarrassed about anything. Like you said, he almost lost his leg. But I guarantee you the competitor inside of Tiger gets off the green going, what the hell am I doing out here doing this? And a lot of that, a lot of people can point to the full swing and the health. But to me, a lot of that stuff, the, the short game, specifically putting and, and close proximity putting, has just been atrocious from him in his return the uh yeah i uh it's it's hard it's just it, you know what it is and this is the thing when you play a lot of tournament golf you know how to keep momentum going yep like you just it's it's a matter of just getting around and I, this is the way i feel now whenever i play like a a real round of golf which is very rarely it's like i'm like you know what i played really well but I literally got nothing out of it. Yep. And when you get nothing, when you feel like you get nothing out of it, a lot of times it's just like, you know what? Like I hit a bad lag putt to six feet and I missed the six footer or I didn't get up and down from like right over here. And it was a really simple up and down that like if I was, you know, really in form, it's just like I'm thinking about making the, the chip instead of like I'm just praying to hit it inside of five feet. You know, I think that's the thing is there's just a level of sharpness that that you're missing out on when you don't play enough tournament golf and try and play golf. Um, well, the, uh, and, and Andy, this, I think, you know, you and I have played a lot of tournament golf and you kind of understand those feels. A lot of people out there maybe haven't played as much tournament golf, but I mean, this is the same. It's, it's equatable in so many ways of life. You know, you think about runners that take a month off of running and then you go out there and you're like, why I'm 20 seconds slower per mile than I was a month ago, or you take six weeks off of going to the gym and lifting weights and you go there and you pick up a weight you were comfortably pushing for a while. And all of a sudden you can't push that as comfortably. It it falls off pretty quickly when you don't do it a lot. And the same can be said about tournament golf. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like little things. It's just, you make stupid mistakes. I think that's the biggest thing. Even if you have, you know, arguably the highest golf course IQ, you know, in terms of like how to, uh, take down a golf course like Tiger, you're still going to make these silly mistakes because you're just not used to your brain's not used to processing the information the way it used to be Um, like that. That's one of the other things is like your brain just moves a little bit faster when you're not doing it a lot. Um, Do you have any other takeaways from the open? No, just I mean, the the, the Xander thing was crazy. It's very impressive. He did this. Andy, I think we've talked at the at, at length about this over time with the move to the PJ championship being moved to the middle of the major season. Somebody could get hot and tick off a couple of majors. And Xander did that. He's really, to me, the first player that took advantage of that part of the major season in terms of winning them. And so it's crazy. My question for you, and I know you guys are going to do a little bit of this on the fried egg podcast, but I wanted to ask you this. You look at the list of multi-major winners of this current era. You know, you've got you've got Rory and you've got Brooks, obviously, with a whole bunch of majors. You got Jordan, then you got what is it, JT, Scotty, Rom, Xander. Mm-hmm. When you think about this crop of players that are in that two category of major winners, who do you think is going to end their career with the most? Because I honestly I think it's Xander. I think I'm gonna I think I would comfortably wow. go Xander. 
So you think he's going to get like six majors? I don't know if he'll get six, but I think he could get. No, I'm not. I'm not saying he's going to pass Brooks. I'm saying of the players that have won two. So I'm oh, saying when you compare. That, yeah, so Morikawa, so Mount Morikawa. I don't think we can count DJ anymore. Agreed. Um, <laughs> he'll probably go win one though, like just like out of nowhere. I'll tell you this: he he bodied Brooks in that third round. He made a double late, but in those tough conditions, he played awesome. I had him on the they had that feature group channel going with DJ and Brooks. Brooks shot seven or eight over. DJ played awesome for sixteen and a half holes and made a double late. I think the one that's most interesting of the group here. I think it. I you know it. It's really actually a fascinating question. John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, Bryson DeChambeau, and Xander. Yep. And then, and then, who, and then you've who got, gets you've the got most you've got, out of and those? You've, and you've, you've, got got J- J- you've got JT there, who I don't think we'd pick, and you've got Morikawa as well. And I, you know, Morikawa had a sneaky pretty good year in yep. majors. Um, I just I don't know about the horsepower anymore for Morikawa. Yep. Um, I you know it, it that's that's a fast I I think Scotty at the Masters just like that's hard to beat. He's like a, we used to say this about Spieth. Yep. But he's basically just like a souped up version of Spieth. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? Like it's like oh he might actually be better around the greens and he's like not it's not even close to who the best iron player is in yeah. the world. And he hits it like 30 yards longer than George. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know. That's it's funny because last year, I think at the end of last year, you would undeniably, uh, if I gave you these four players, say Rom. Yep. After the U.S. Open or after the Masters, you'd undeniably say Scotty Scheffler. Yep. Um, after the U.S. Open, you're probably torn between Scheffler and you might even say Bryson. And now it's like Xander. I mean, this is like the beauty of the sport, right? It's like we, these these majors shift the way we think about players so much. Um, and we get prisoner of like recency bias. I mean, Xander, the thing about Xander is like there, there's nowhere his game doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys said it on the podcast on, on Sunday night, but this was the major he was the least impressive at in his career. And that's with a a second place finish in the open. I mean, you look at his U S open resume, you're talking about one of the, the great U S open resumes of all time for somebody to start their career. He has one finish outside of the top 10 and eight starts in a U.S. open. So that's seven top tens and U S opens and eight starts. And the one he finished outside the top 10 was a tie for 14th. He's going to win a U.S. open. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue that. So it, to me, it goes to, He's a great Masters player. Can he win at Augusta? And yes, he can. He's such a good putter. I just feel like, I feel like Xander winning two. He talked about it after the putt at the PGA. You know, he said, so much relief came with me making that putt, right? He got to excel, finally won a major. And now he picks up a second one with this epic, epic, awesome final round in really tough conditions for the week. And he wins the one maybe he was not expected to win when you kind of look at who Xander is. But I think when you, you list those players, and you think about the way they play these other majors, you know, Scotty playing the other three that's not Augusta. And you think about guys like Bryson, who the Open's going to be the one that he might struggle at the most, a little bit at Augusta National as well. I just feel like Xander's a guy that his game is going to win a U.S. Open and he's going to contend in, in two or three Masters and he might win one. Yeah, I think when you think about it that way, you made a good point here, is that I think Bryson, as of right now, you kind of have to like almost... I think like he played one great round at Augusta National this year, and then it was kind of like pretty mediocre after yeah. that. It was like he kind of just like kind of faded down the leaderboard, but it was a big step in the sense like I still think that golf course is going to give him some trouble. Agreed. But the um, you almost like... Xander, Scotty, and Rom clearly have more opportunities. Like they go into every year because of the the well rounded nature of their games and and their strengths. They have four opportunities every year, where Bryson might have like two and a half. Yep. And and I think Morikawa probably has like it's got to be a really good fit at this point with how much how much talent there is at the top of the game and. Uh, and JT, I think, is the same. It's like got to be. And I I think that he's like kind of 
I don't know if the, I, I think regressed is probably the right word um, to a point where he's he's not uh, even I, I think he's kind of like almost like a. A very clear, maybe second or top of the third tier player on tour yeah, at great. this point. Yep. Um, which is which is wild because he used to be the top of the barrel. So uh, yeah, that's a super interesting question. If I had to pick one, I think I and I think I'd go. I'd still go Scheffler. PJ, who are you going with? I I I agree on Scotty. Okay. That's that's my lean. But I do. I I mean, Xander's so good. And he's got the U.S. Open thing is definitely. I mean, that feels like a lock at this point. So then it's, hey, Scotty, can you win outside of Augusta? Because I would like to see that at some point. Yeah, the putter just sleeping at the Opens this year is just. A, it's another year, Andy. You know, I mean, I, I I've talked a lot about this the last day and a half with Scotty Scheffler, and Andy. This is something that I think you've pushed probably better than anybody in golf media over the last few years. Is the windows of the pro golfer and how the windows are relatively shorter than they used to be considering the depth of talent and the, you know, every year, three or four young guys pop up. I mean, you know, Thor Bjornsson's going to be a force on the PGA tour, right? I mean, I don't know what Gordon Sargent's going to look like, but there's potential for him to be a pretty solid player when he turns professional. Obviously we saw what Dunlop has done this, this season. It's been up and down, but he has the ability and the skill set to win on the PGA tour. I mean, the list goes on. Shipley has been very impressive in the major championships in amateur. I just, I just wonder Scotty's window, I think has been these last three years in the majors. So I think you go, you know, 21, 20 or 22, 23, 24, right? This is kind of part of that window of Scotty Scheffler and Andy, you know, that it's five, six, maybe seven years, unless you're the outlier player like Rory and the window is now in that point about half over for Scotty Scheffler, and he hadn't won a major outside of Augusta. It just it it makes me wonder if it's going to happen because we always expect it to happen. Like Ernie, he's going to win at the Masters, man. It's going to happen. He's not not going to win one of these things. Oh, Norman's going to win one. He'll do it. It's going to happen. And then Colin Montgomery never does, right? I mean, these we always think it's going to happen, and then you know five years into it, you go, shit, dude, this guy's it's still it's still two. It's still just Augusta. Where I will push back here is that Scotty Scheffler is a half a shot per round better than the second best player on tour. Yep. So with, he's the outlier. With, iron, with irons. Yep. With yep. irons. Like, to me, like, the distance thing, he's, I think he's either at the top or or near the top of strokes gained off the tee. Um, he's very, very high up in the, in that in that stat, but the, the approach play, like if he slips up a little bit with approach play, what's he a, a third of a shot better for 0.25? Like he's got such a gulf. I mean, like we talk about Xander being this great iron player. Scotty picks up a third of or three quarters of a shot per round approaching the green on Xander, right? Now he might make a, a lot of that back on putting, right? But I just think that approach play is such a skill that that is like kind of transcendent. I mean, it it allows such freedom with how you play off the tee. It allows so much freedom in in just the way you can approach the game that I think that to me is is like just the skill. I mean, so like to He's fourth off the tee and first um, approaching the green. It's just like those, you just, I don't think, do you think he's going to lose it? Like the only way his window closes is if he like loses his, uh, if he starts swinging poorly, which I don't think we've seen any sign of him becoming like a, a, going from an ultra, ultra elite ball striker to a, a, Really, really, really good ball striker. Like I, I just, I'd have a hard time believing that somebody's going to overtake him. Strokes gain T to green anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, I and I would, I would agree with that, and I think that's a great point. And again, I think it goes back to the Rory point you've made a lot about his ability to have this run for what 
11, 12, 13 years. I mean, it's been remarkable. Like and he's 15, 16 years. Now, yeah, I mean, I he's he's the outlier of this point. Right. And the reason being is Rory is elite in terms of ball striking. Right. I mean, his ability at the driver as good as anybody in the world, very far, relatively straight, you know, almost gets longer and straighter as the years go on. And he's also been a great iron player. It's like that's going to carry you throughout whatever generation you're playing against. And that's the same skill set Scotty has yet. Scotty has it even better than, than Rory had it. So maybe the window's 10 years. My point is that we just went through three years where Scotty was one of the best players was the best player in the world. And he hasn't won a major outside of Augusta. And he's had a lot of opportunities to do so. I think the other thing is, is the age. Um, Scotty's 27. Yeah. Um, Xander's 30. That's not insignificant, right? Um, but they're effectively, I mean, we, we did this, but they're effectively on like a very similar clip in terms of, of top tens, top fives, like same percentages. Scotty obviously has two wins and, and, and significantly less major starts than Xander, but like same percentage basis of how often they're in the mix. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing debate. I think that's a, a great, great question. Um, and I think like John Rahm, it's not like. It's not inconceivable. John Rahm is like, you know, we're, you know, does he have a, he have a bounce back beer or year next year. And he all of a sudden were like, kind of feel silly for doubting him. I, I, and I agree with that. It's easy to sleep on him after the season he had, but I mean, John Rahm, when he's healthy and he's playing well, and he seems like he's get, he maybe he's maybe gets a little bit more comfortable over the next six, seven months with the life he's in now. And he gets back to, to major championship golf that we've seen. Andy, I got another question for you. Another question I wanted to throw your way. Because all right. Question Z- hour. Z- <laughs> Xander, pay, you know, changed coaches and picked up some, some speed and some distance in the off season. What do you feel like in terms of, let's say top 10, top 12 players in the world, what player do you think needs to do something this off season to give them a chance to kind of trampoline ahead of where they sit right now with their current golf game, with the golf game, they present week to week, major to major tournament to tournament that you think could maybe put them in a position to do something similar to what we saw from Xander this season? I think Colin Morikawa, if he could pick up 20 yards, it's would exactly be exactly what I was going to say. It's exactly the same place I, I was at Andy. It's if he could do something in a similar fashion to Xander, where it seemingly he did not lose any, any type of iron play, um, you know, his short game didn't like, I think more cow is super interesting where he's gotten himself into the mix at a lot of majors where he's, he's a little bit, he's very much shorter than long players on tour and his short game and putting, I don't think is like superb. It's like, you know, the right. iron play. So I think he's got, he's like one of these players that like I look at and it's like, you know, he could get dramatically better. Um, did you have anybody else? No, that was really the one I was thinking about. I've been thinking about it since the comments he made at Augusta. And then you think about how, as you've mentioned, Andy, you know, having an elite skill set to separate yourself from even the best players in the world. We've talked plenty about Morikawa's iron play, but it seems like he's the dude that could do what Xander did. Add 12 pounds of muscle, you know, do whatever they do, whatever you can to pick up speed, because if he could pick up 15 or 20 yards. He's already a great driver of the golf ball in terms of stats, but you look at kind of distance wise and yeah. he's lacking. I mean, I'd see he's, he's 137th on the PJ tour in driving distance this season, but strokes gained off the tee. He's 16th. Cause he could hit a whole bunch of fairways. If he could do what we saw from Jaeger or Xander in this off season and add a little bit of speed, I think he would be even more competitive in the majors than what we've seen. And he was competitive this season already. I Yeah. And I think like um, I was watching live from on Sunday night uh, and Brandel highlighted something just showed he did a great job of showing the difference between um, like what the speed does. And it, he illustrated it through Justin Rose, who's who's a long player, um, not like crazy long, but he's long. Um where Justin Rose hit it on 15 after he pumped a drive, like, you know, T grab drive and where Xander hit it. Xander's, he obviously caught a slope, he, but he picked up this, this speed and, it, and he catches the slope and he's, he's 40 yards, 30, 40 yards yeah. past Justin Rose. And, and just like, if you just think about that from the idea of hitting maybe a nine iron into a green versus a six iron, 
I mean, you're just going to hit it closer a lot more often. I mean, it's not, it's, and it's not necessarily about like, I think Scotty's a great example of this. Like Scotty, Scotty hits a lot of different drives there. The video I think about all the time, I brought it up. It's I, I, th- I used to say it was a DP world tour video. It's a tailor made video where Scotty shows like he's got like he, how he tees the ball different. He, he has these different shots. Like he has a little squeeze cut. This is like fairway finder. And if he wants to let it go, he, he tees it up high and he like really sends it. Scotty, it's not necessarily about like, okay, I've got this speed. I'm going to go all out all the time. It's just about having it in the tank for certain situations totally, totally. where you can push the pedal down. And it's like, okay, it, I can get this out there a little bit further and I can turn a 500 yard par four into something that can become a scoring opportunity. And that's what I think like, that's the value, the real value of distance, especially like we see a golf course like Troon that that really restrained distance. But it did give some opportunities where you could separate yourself. And, and it, I think Brandel pointed out, Xander had more putts for birdie inside 20 feet than anybody else out there. And that's the type of stuff that distance buys you because you just get those shorter clubs in. And it's not like... You know, the, I think the thing I appreciate about, about the way Xander and Scotty play is it's not full flaps all the time. It's right. not like we're just going to punch in the nuclear codes and go all out every time <laughs> on the tee. It's like it the is, way Bryson hits his driver. <laughs> yeah, it is. There is some like there's some calculated, measured. There's the, there's different driver swings. There's it's like different pitches. It's like a pitcher having a four seamer that can hit a hundred, but also the two seamer that that paints the corner and has a little movement on it that, that it, it is 92. Well, you know? Andy, Andy, I mean, I mean the, per, I think the, the best comp to this is somebody like Roger Federer in terms of serving, right? Roger Federer was not Andy Roddick with his serve, but Rod, but, but Federer could hit the spots as good as Andy. I think Andy said on the podcast um, over Wimbledon, by the way, I love the Andy Roddick podcast. I don't know if you got into it or not, but I'm a big fan of it. But he said, nobody could hit spots better in the history of tennis than Roger Federer could, but Federer had a gear he could get to when he really wanted to pump a first serve where he could get it up into the high 120s, mid 130s, when he really wanted to kind of give it a little extra oomph. But he knew also he could pick his spots. And if he's hitting that kind of slice serve with a lot with 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 exceptional precision, he didn't have to hit it as hard as possible every single time. If you're somebody like Andy Roddick, kind of comping him to a Bryson, they're going full flaps every single time because they know they have that speed in it. If they miss it, whatever, right? But I love what you're saying about some of these drivers. It's not always having to pound it the way you do, but being able to put it in a good place. And Andy, you know this. Sometimes your longest drives go when you're not absolutely going after it, right? Yeah. You hit kind of that low one that doesn't have a lot of spin. It's going to roll 30, 40 yards if, you, if you're connecting with it the right way. That's I, I I think that was like one of the impressive things about Rory at, at Pinehurst was the different, you know, the yes. you could see like that he hit those low balls. Like I think that's the thing, you know, the most impressive drivers. And, and this is where I think like if you took your question and, and talked about Ludwig would be another one that like I feel like with with he just needs to like play more golf. Totally. Right. Totally. totally. Like, and it's, it's, I think like probably this, this experience at Troon's going to be a good one where he got like just blown out to see. <laughs> and he's probably going to be like, you know what? I need some more shots. Right. Yep. And he's like the quintessential kind of like optimized young player coming in that, you know, really might not have like ever I think he's played some events that probably are similar but it, it had some tough conditions but this one you know it's like oh wow like I need to have a few more um weapons in my array of 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 uh shots and I think that I don't know I I think like one of the best things that could happen for golf um that seems to be happening uh in general is like are we going to get to a place where the majors are so outsizedly important, which I think they're becoming, that it starts to Im- impact how players play week in, week out in, on tour thinking about majors? And what will happen from that, like, you know, and this might be years down the line, is that major or the tour venues will adapt and start to change, like long term. I think that that's a, a way that something would work. There's like a downstream effect that could happen where 
maybe we get better setups from from tour courses when when these players start to realize like these are this is bad preparation for majors like this is i mean i, I yeah i think we saw that in houston right andy in 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 a, in a limited like amount of time where the where the houston open basically said we're going to make it a gust alike with the green speed so the players want to come here and play the, the week before the masters right didn't they do that i mean they did that yeah. years ago um the sad thing is something like trinity forest I always said would be an unbelievable week before the open venue, right? If you found like firm, fast, middle of the summer, Dallas, Texas, where it's hot as hell, you could emulate a lot of the golf shots that these players have to hit. Unfortunately, all the tour guys bitched about it. And so they ended up moving away from it, but well, they never per- really gave it a chance because they, they watered the sh- they watered the shit out of it right before the tournament. Yeah. But, but, but I think <laughs> you're, I think you're right. I think, I think giving these, you know, you think about what Shane Lowry talked about headed into that open. He's like, I came down here and played a couple times. Right. I just want to get a feel for what this golf course plays like. And, uh, I mean, Xander talked about it, how like you have, he have to play the Scottish open beforehand. Right. I, I think like if you start to like zoom out it, it, if these players care, if the majors continue to be elevated and like, really like, I think we're getting to a point where like, nobody really cares about what happened, what, how many wins you have on the PGA tour. Like look at it now. Scotty's been extraordinary. He's been amazing. And Xander picks off two majors. He has no other wins. And people are like, he's the player of the year. I know. I know. I know. And I mean, and and honestly, like, I know it's a silly, you know, pundity debate. But when you talk about what is important, the funny thing about this debate, Andy, that cracks me up is what makes this an actual debate is live. So you're talking about the PGA Tour Player of the Year award. And the reason that it might swing one way is because of live, right? It's because the live players are actually in the field at the majors versus the non, you know, yeah. majors that that don't have the live guys in there. So it's it's this really weird conversation to have around why Xander's the player of the year over a Scotty Scheffler who's won six times, you know, with the marquee event the PJ Tour puts together in the Masters. Yet a lot of us are going to say, you know, Marco Mira had the best season in '98 because he won two major championships, right? Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh... It's it's a fascinating aspect. Let's get to the schedule of the week here. <laughs> we got the 3M Open in uh, in Blaine, uh, Minneapolis at TPC Twin Cities, or as this podcast likes to call it, TPC Sod Farm. Famously, this golf course was a sod farm before the golf uh, before the golf course existed. Um, so it's the the first. The final two events before the start of the FedEx Cup playoffs. So you got this, then you got a week off for the Olympics, and then you come back with Sedgefield, uh, which will will cap it off. Notable name that's not in the field that's out of the out of the FedEx Cup. The, probably the most notable name. Do you know who it is? No. Ricky. No way. No it's chance. Like, he has no chance it? to finish in the top seventy. Is that why? I th- no. I I mean, like I think he's probably just playing the. Uh, the uh the sedge field but i mean he's he's 98 he's almost a hundredth in points kind of crazy get, i'm surprised they, he's not playing do you do they let you in the olympics even if you didn't qualify if you have an olympic tattoo is that the deal does he get to go play even if he's just got the tattoo so he's still in it's like grandfathered you know in grandfathered into the event I think Ricky probably had a pretty good time. I think at the time of the Olympics, he was single. Um, you know that because well, I mean, that was 2016, eight years ago. He was he was late 20s. Uh, I think he was at the time single, roaming around the Olympic Village. That that probably was a good time. I love Ricky Fowler. I I'm, I'm, I, I love Ricky. I appreciate Ricky more and more every year. I like that he's like now like he's not the cool edgy guy anymore and he's just like full dad. Andy, did you see what he was wearing on Sunday at the open? It was like no. it was like 2012 orange level of pants, you know, where he really? won when he wore when he was like 23 years old. It was they were so orange. They almost kind of looked like they were joggers, but they weren't. But it just cracks me up. Every time I see it, I laugh. It makes me smile. It brings me back to a simpler time in golf. Um I think Ricky's a relatively underappreciated golfer at this point for what he did to golf before golf was really quote unquote cool. He was cool. He was different. He was unique. Like I know we pushed it probably a little too hard, but you know what else? I think too? It was a, a little bit it might be an understatement. Yeah, probably, probably, we might have leaned on it. A little, like he was he was on PJ Tour Live every single week, but 
you know, he's just, he's like a normal good dude, you know, and that's yeah. really hard to be when you're that famous. I think like anybody that anybody I've encountered that's friends with with Ricky, like genuinely, like the, they are just and I, I they, he's the best guy. I've heard that like over and over and over again. I think he's played the game magnificently. I think there's this like if you are if you, once you catch like the the eye of golf and you become like this market, the best thing you could do is never say anything. That's exactly right. That's Hey, listen, if we learn anything from Tiger Woods, say zero things ever. When somebody asks think- you a question, how the round went, you go, I don't know, man, I'm ready to get lunch. And then the entire reporting room will laugh and then you walk off and that's all you got to do. I think like Matt Kuchar was the shining example of this where he, everybody's like, what a good guy. This guy is such a good guy. <laughs> And then the tipping story came out and it was all over. You yeah, know, everybody was like, wait and a was minute. A, but Kutcher never, he never said anything. That's right. That's right. Give it a week. This story will blow over. Nobody's going to care about it. The only people that care are the nerds like me and you, Andy. You want a little bubble, bubble talk, FedEx Cup bubble of, talk? Of course I do. All right. Uh, Grio, here's the 66 through 75. Well, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, real quick. Knowing you, Big part of this podcast. I would like you to start at number 60, please. Can you start at number 60 for me? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, just the guy is in that. In that. What so, number is he? I don't think he can fall out. Just a guy. Jordan Spieth at number 60. That's all right, a, there you go. That's all that's I needed. A, that's a spot a lot of superstars inhabit in the FedEx Cup and, <laughs> and going closing in on August. Uh, Taylor Moore, 61. Mark Hubbard, Homeless Hub, 62. God, is Nick- he 62? Dude, he's had such a good year. How is he 62? I mean, this, is, this is the thing. This is what th- making it more competitive. It's yeah. like making the playoffs in baseball. It's like hard. You got to play well. You know, that's why why my Chicago uh, Cubs never make the playoffs anymore. You know, it's just hard to make the playoffs. But anyways, he uh, let's see what his results. Just to give an idea. What's uh, I mean, he's had a good he's had a really good solid year. I got him right here if you want to. Two, two, so 21 events played, 20 cuts made, two top 10s, five top 25s. You know, All but two cuts. That's pretty good. That's very consistent. He's had a third at, at Zurich, the team event and fourth at Pebble Beach. Uh, lots of lots of T50s. I find. <laughs> that's uh, that's that's fine. T20 at Farmers. OK, year, you know, yeah. fringe fringe. Play. That's like an eight seed, you know, okay, and I think okay, that's okay. that's right. He's yep. right in the spot. Uh, Dunlap, who's ridiculous, like <laughs> to give you an idea if he got he's <laughs> this is insane. So he is he is 63rd. If he had his 500 points. He'd be roughly 30th, 30, 32nd. 30 I mean, that, what, what, what are, he'd be what, a, like to, be, to give you an idea where he'd be is Stevie Yeager, Thomas Dietrich. He'd be ahead of Max Homa, 33rd. Max would be 34th. JT Post and Cameron Young. This is the, instead he's down here with two, no offense. I love homeless hubs. Don't two go top, hubs. Come two on top now. 10 homeless hubs. Andy, there is one player. On the PGA Tour that has more wins than Nick Dunlap this year. And that's Scotty. That's it. Like him, McIntyre, Rory. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if we could count the CUDA. I'm counting the CUDA. It's, it's a 1.5 win. So you got to uh, put Xander ahead of him. Uh, well, that's, that's, I mean, I, I, I definitely think it's fair to put Xander ahead of him. You can't put Rory ahead of him. No. You can't put Rory ahead of him with two wins when I'm a team event. He's that 1.5 win guy, too. No, no. Come on now. You <laughs> got to give the- 1.25. Yeah, or 1.48 is I'm fine with. But I can't I can't say a team event's the same as Dunlap actually winning events by himself. That's true. That's true. Although Lowry's comments afterward, after that event, would suggest that Rory won it by himself. Well, that's just that's fair. That's a, that's a fair point. Because <laughs> then that's he went and won a Quail Hollow next with the next one, start, I'm right? I'm telling you, I'm giving him 149, just under, just under. <laughs> that's fine. Um, all right. So, Seamus, B. Todd, Todd Watch is on Bubble Watch. That's a good one. There we you could go. have Todd, we could have the Todd uh, binocular logo that uh, I think uh, that Jason Page made. You know, it's like one of those, the binoculars you put the quarters in and a yep, sightseeing. Yep. Todd Watch looking at a big bubble would be a good, you know, promo. By, uh, by the way, those those binocular things you're talking about, like on the Empire State Building and stuff, I th- thought those would go away post-COVID. Nope, they still exist. No, they make it, so much money. Have I, you ever used it? 
I met I met someone that owns the one of those businesses and and the guy was telling me how much money they make like there's like God. this fit I mean like think about like you you just have you install them and then you just have a person that goes around and pulls the quarters out it's like that's disgusting. your business that's yeah. your business like it's, the best. It's, it's like the other business I really want to get into is parking garages yeah, well, I, my my dad owned two car washes when I was in high school. That's like a the great drive business. Up. Man, you talk about cool stuff. I'd go like twice a week to pull money out of them, and you would just pull this stack of ones and fives out, and just all these quarters and all these things. I felt like I was the richest guy in the world, you know. Car wash is a good business too. Yeah, anyway, yeah. It's, uh, env- the businesses I'm envious of are uh, sightseeing uh, binoculars. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Andy's going to get into it. He's going to he's going to transition the uh, what, what was your your logo? What did you guys have the the logo for the event I played in uh, last year, Lancaster? What was that logo? That was kind of the scene eyes like the, or something. Yeah, it was like the War of Roses logo. Yeah. Um, here's. That. Here's a question. Do you think we could we could do a sightseeing uh, business where we get we put the binoculars over famous golf courses and you could go up there, and put quarters in. Oh, and make like, a, are you kidding me? Make a trillion dollars. Put it at like the amusement park next to Pine Valley. Just put it up. Yeah. On one of the high spots there. You can just look right down into it. <laughs> Splash World. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Splash, Where, where'd Splash you end? World. Where, where'd you end? You aim Seamus Power. We have Grio. Oh, Grio, Mav McNeely, uh, beneficiary of some, of some big sponsor exemptions. Yeah. Vic Perez, Davis Riley, Luke List. Lucas Glover, last Bubble year's boy. sensation, on the outside looking in right now. TGL, TGL star. <laughs> that might have been a hasty invite to TGL. <laughs> that, that, might, that might be a little like me saying Xander's going to end with the most majors like two days after he won his second major. <laughs> Lee Hodges, your co-host, fellow podcaster, Andrew Putnam. Oh, let's go. Let's go, Putnam. Played great in the CUDA. I think he's going to have a good week this week. You brought up Andy Roddick and his his podcast. I ran into Ra- Andy Roddick a couple weeks ago, and I said, "Hey, fellow podcaster," and the look he gave me back was like, "Not good." Oh, it did was. He, did he say I think anything? He was like, I think he just looked at me like, "What a fucking idiot this yeah, guy yeah, is." Yeah, yeah. That's 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 what you get a lot. I mean, imagine being famous. Imagine being that famous. How many dumb comments you get from people day in and day out? Well, I'm sure he's like this guy. We're coll- we're fellow podcasters, yeah, you know. He yeah. uh, doesn't know how successful your podcast is, you know. Oh, it's uh, I don't know. I don't think we're probably in the same class as his podcast. Yeah, that's you probably know? it's fair. That's fair. Uh, we got uh, Putnam Shank, uh, your fellow podcaster Andrew Putnam, Adam Shank, uh, Keith Mitchell, Nikolai Hogard, the Kitty Cat, Kirk Kitayama. I think that we can cut it off there. Adam I, Sensen, yeah. Ben yeah. Coles, Char- Charlie Hoffman, Tough Boy. I, I think when you get to Hoffman, I think we can stop. I think that's about the point to stop doing that. Yeah, I mean the big name last year. Obviously, we had the. Uh, the Justin Thomas yeah. watch this year is probably a little less interesting. We have the uh, the Ricky watch, but now, I, you know I, what? I, you could lean into the Lucas Glover thing. I think that'll be a fun a fun conversation starter if you were a broadcaster over the next week. I mean, you obviously could show the flashbacks to the way he played last year, um, non sweaty pants edition, and then you lean into where he's at right now, and you'd be good to go. PJ, did you just take? Uh, was that AG one drink you just did right there? What are you that drinking? AG, he's drinking AG one Coke. Is that a Coke? No, not not a Coke. Just I see. Looks sorry. like looks, sorry, looks a little, sorry to disappoint. Looks a little like AG one. I got to be honest with you. Anyway, go ahead. Hey, you got to pick somebody this week for uh, Brendan. We haven't. Oh. We aren't getting through the schedule. All right, hold on. This me, is me, a disaster yeah. episode. No, 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 it'll be good. This is how it is every time we do it. <laughs> it uh, I mean, I mean, I, I got. I'll go. I'll go. Putnam. I'll take Putnam. All right, Putnam. I'm taking. I guess I still have Sam Burns. I got Billy Boy. I feel like distance is a big thing here. God, who am I going to go with? I'll well, take is, Taylor this, Pendrick. This is good podcast. President's Cup. President's Cup. <laughs> He's going to hit it long. Hey, hey Andy, how, the President's Cup this year. I mean, it's going to be. It's going to be an all timer. Spieth is twenty fifth. I was looking this morning. He is one good week away from somebody from being oh, out gosh. of the graphic. Hey, hey, Andy, if 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 Spieth, if you had a bet. Fifteen thousand dollars of your own money on Spieth on or off the President's Cup team. Which way are you going? On. 
You think he's going to make it? You think he's going to Buddy take Ball. It? We got yeah, Buddy yeah. Ball. Who's the captain? What about who's you? The cap- who's the captain this year? I all I know about the President's Cup is that. Do you know who the great. President's Cup captain is? Because I don't know. Do you know? I think it's Stricker, right? It's Furick. Furick. And Furyk <laughs> and Furyk and the friends buddy- is the yeah. next week. It's a big couple of weeks for Jim. And there's no way Jordan could be on the President's Cup team. I just don't think. Um, I don't think it happened. It is buddy. You, this is going to test the limits of Buddy Ball. I think it's going to be a good precursor. Uh, uh, speaking of Buddy Ball. Webb Simpson uh, announced as assistant captain for Keegan Bradley. This is a new cabal, a new regime coming in here. So, this is this is where we're at in the golf season. This is assistant captains for a for an event taking place in fifteen months. <laughs> my my enduring image of of Webb Simpson will be him saddled with Bubba Wat or was he saddled with Bubba Watson or Phil? At uh, at like golf national. No, I think, I think he played Bubba. with everybody. Andy, he played with everybody. Bubba. He was like the guy they had to they had to put into they had to put in spots. Remember, it was the guy that fit the golf course, like a guy that could like keep the ball in play. And they kept saddling on. Wasn't Bubba sick? He was sick that yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and they, he they was got... like he was elbow bumping Bubba. All right, so, like so you, what, you pair what, the guy that fits the golf course with a guy that doesn't fit the golf course at all. One of the most inaccurate players. And, so he, and it's just he played with Bubba Webb, got smoked by Ian and, and Rory and foursomes <laughs> in the afternoon. And then they rolled him back out there. Uh, let's see here. He didn't. Oh, they rolled him out there with Bubba again. And they yes. won. They won that next one against Sergio and Alex. <laughs> he, Lauren. Carried, he carried them. He carried them. And then Bubba Webb was just, sick. Webb just Webb just smoked Justin Rosen singles. That's that's the thing. It was the one guy that fit the golf course well on the American team. I mean, you talk about like all time all time team selection blunder. Yeah. I mean, you had Phil out there who couldn't play, just couldn't play at all. all yeah, Bryson, all, all, all time terrible terrible Ryder Cup team. Um, but uh, hey, can I ask you a question before we go? Yeah. Um, who do you think? Who do you think of the American players wins a gold medal in the Olympics? If you had to pick an American player, I think it's Morikawa. I think the golf that. course. I think the golf course sets up well for Colin. Um, I mean Scotty. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like, why would why would I not pick Scotty? Yeah. How did how did we go? How did we go an hour on the Wednesday after the Open? TPC Sod Farm podcast. How do we go an hour? I think it's I think it was because I kept asking PJ questions. I think it's the right. main reason. All right. Other other events. US Junior this week. I'll give that the event of the week. At uh Oakland Hills. So excited to see the you know, Gil Hans did a uh, restoration in Oakland Hills a few years ago during COVID. Um outstanding golf course. I can't wait for the US Open there in whatever. I think it's twenty thirty one. Um That'll be on Golf Channel the final two days of play. So that's I think that's Friday, Saturday. Friday, you get a little cock and a little Golf Channel. Tape delayed Golf Channel. But you can watch it on the cock from uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. I, um, I, I got to say, um, you know, when I was doing all that USGA stuff with Fox back in the day, my favorite events were the the junior AMs and the and the amateurs. I absolutely love doing these things. You know, you get a chance to watch the future stars playing and playing for something that matters i mean it's the biggest event in junior golf and uh i always loved it art my favorite one i did we had akshay thor bjornson at balthus roll was just an epic back and forth and yeah. uh, again you know you're watching these two dudes and then all of a sudden you know they're they're the people that matter on the pj tour so i miss miss doing those if, a lot if you're interested here are a couple names that you should watch blades brown um yep. i think he played on the corn fair he might have played the myrtle beach tournament but He's Absolute a stud. Yeah, My- Miles Russell, another guy that's played a couple PGA Tour events. He's made a cut. Um, he played. I think he made the cut on the Corn Ferry Tour. Obviously, you have Billy Davis, who is uh, Anna Davis's uh, younger brother. Uh, very, very good player. One that I would throw out there, Luke Colton. I was about um, to say. If you didn't say it, I was going to say it. He just qualified for the amateur uh, as well for second straight year. Dude is. He's a stud. Dude is an absolute stud, man. He is an absolute he. So he was he was medalist at my U.S. Amateur qualifier last year uh, when we both got through, and he shot sixty four final round at the qualifier I was at. I think he was fifteen at the time or something. I mean, he's so good. Hey, another really good player is Henry Henry Guan. 
um, another Texas kid. Uh, but there are a lot of really, really great players um, that are are coming up, and it, it this tournament should be super fun to watch. Those granted the small windows, but they should be they're worth turning in for the golf course, um, and then also uh, the level of play is going to be super high. So. Hey, hey, real quick before we go on this thing, um, the Charlie Woods deal. Oh, yeah. 82. It, it, I I mean, like the brawny thing is one thing, but basketball is a reactionary sport and you kind of can go out there and play basketball. Brawny is also 19 years old in, uh, in, in the NBA now. No, I know. I know. But my, my point is golf is a sport where you're on – you're on the playing field for five hours and you're in your thoughts all the time. You got 500 people, a thousand people out there watching you. I know guys, I know Charlie's not playing the the level of golf. He wants to play in these events. This stuff's going to help him, man. This is going to help him a ton as he gets a little bit older and gets a little bit more comfortable in these situations. Like I know he's shooting these high numbers, but I think he's it's there. Gonna, it's going to qualify. Yep. It's going to benefit a medalist, him a lot. Is it, this is, I just think that golf, like we get too lost in like, especially the Charlie Woods thing is it, it's just a disaster. Everybody it's, it, that's, it it's is, like it an is. ambulance chasing media play. Like it's, we're going to, we're going to, we're just chasing clicks and we're using this kid as a vehicle because he's the son of the most famous golfer in the yeah. world. And we're going to draw out these, these big narratives about what Charlie Woods is going to be. I don't, I'm not saying I think Charlie Woods is going to be a great golfer. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that I've seen this movie a million times where you could go back and and probably uh, look through some great top 30 players who were not great necessarily great junior players, like all-time great. Because the thing about golf is that improvement is not linear. This, yeah. this is it's a, such a different sport. It's not about like necessarily like, you know, in in the NFL, it's like, oh, he runs a four three. And he's six foot two and he can jump, you know, four. he has a 40 inch vertical. Like he's going to be an NFL player. And you know that if they don't get injured, like because they have the measurables. Golf is so much about just figuring out how to play the game, progressing and you improve at different stages of your life. You grow at different times of your life. It changes the way you play golf. Like and I think for for Charlie Woods, for every golfer and every every single one, we just listed off five kids that are like phenoms that are great, great young players. They might not be the best players at age 22. Yep. Yep. And I think like, that's the thing that everybody has to keep. I don't, I'm, I'm like pretty frustrated in general with the Charlie Woods discourse. I agree with you. I I think it's such bullshit. Um, and he's there, man. Like, like there's a lot of really, really talented junior players that did not qualify for the junior amateur. He's out there. He's playing. He's figuring this out. This is why junior golf is important. This is why junior sports are important is because to your point, there are always going to be the Jordan Spieth and the Justin Thomases and the can't miss prospects. I I talked to Andrew about Xander on the get a grip podcast this week. And he was talking about how he played Xander in college. I go, was he impressive? Did you remember much about him? And he goes, I honestly didn't remember anything about him. Like he wasn't the best player on their team. You know, you think about Zach Johnson at Drake, like this isn't can't miss stud that's going to make it. I mean, obviously the expectations and what we think about Charlie are going to be higher than anybody else that exists in junior golf. But I am extremely impressed that he's there and making these championships and qualifying for these big events is the first step to success. And I think people dragging anybody that's a kid for a high score they shoot a is a shithead and b needs to look insular versus looking at somebody like this and going 82 the golf course is hard man it's a usga yeah, championship it's a USGA. and and it's just a different experience it's a completely different feel i i remember i mean like a i spent like basically like my whole life wanting to qualify for a usga event yep, and i didn't same. accomplish it until i was like 31 or 32 i i cried after I got in when I talked to my dad, because it was like this thing that we had done for, you know, that I'd been trying and I'd had some near misses. And like you think about all the times that you didn't do it and you finally do it. And then I remember I went to the, the event. I was so, so nervous in the practice round. I was oh, nervous yeah. in the practice round. Same, same. I, I played I played the amateur. I was 39 when I qualified for my first USGA championship. And I'm playing a practice round with Stu Hagestead. I remember on the first tee at Colorado Golf. Same thing. I was more nervous than I'd been in tournaments 
in yes. my life. Like that was more nervous hitting the tee shot. They announce you in the practice mm-hmm. rounds. Like it's crazy. But anyway, if you're, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm buying Charlie Wood stock. And again, all this stuff, it's going to make it easier on him as he gets older. I know it's kind of hard now. It's almost like the, the really intelligent kid that is struggling through junior high. And you want to go up to those kids and go, hey, man, like I know life, you might be getting bullied and picked on and things like that. Life's going to get better for you as you get older because you're smart and you're going to be successful. And all of a sudden, you're going to be the person that matters when you get a little bit older. And so just get through this shitty time and you'll be fine. And for Charlie, next year, if he qualifies for the junior amateur, I bet he goes out there and plays solid. I bet he goes out there and puts together a good number. And if he doesn't, it's another building block. So uh, I'm rooting for the guy. I like Charlie Woods a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh I don't know. I think I I just I'm I get why people create content around it because it drives engagement, but I also think it's pretty shitty. Yeah. So, um there anyways, that's our Charlie Woods minute. <laughs> you got anything um, else? No, I think you got to go. You got to tee time. Golf. I got to go play. Yeah, play lucky my you. second my second uh, casual round of golf this summer, so I'm going to go do that. All right, Shane, thanks for coming on and uh, we'll talk to you soon. We didn't do any ad reads. So PJ, we're going to stay on and, and do our ad reads and plug them in here. I forgot to go. even look that up. This is where Brendan comes in in handy. It, it'll be good. Uh, PJ, great, uh, great chatting with you in human form. Andy, thanks as always for having me on the pod. Uh, and check out the Get a Grip episode this week. I think you guys will like it.